Greetings for our first uh, Sunday in the fall. Might not feel like it. Those of you who were anticipating and looking forward to uh, Pastor Chris this morning, uh, I uh, sympathize with you as well. I'd love to be hearing him. But at least we get to listen to uh, Prophet Micah. So we're continuing on with our series in the book of Micah. Um, as we go through the book, we'll be uh, looking at uh, many passages. I'm not sure if we have uh, everything uh, projected as we move forward, so I'll read for you. You can follow along if you do have uh, something accessible. I could greet you as well with uh, Micaiah. Micaiah. That's the long form of Micah's name. And uh, how would you respond? Okay, it's up there. Who is like Yahweh? No one, you could say that. Or uh, you could think of uh, the passage that was in the psalm uh, Chris already gave for us. Uh, think of it, the Lord, the Lord. Or uh, this morning I'm going to be using his name, name as it, is, as, as it is given in the Hebrew Bible, Yahweh, 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 uh, the God who is merciful and uh, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in, in steadfast love, covenant love, uh, faithful love, and, uh, and truthfulness, faithfulness. He is slow to anger, and uh, he pardons transgression, iniquity, and sin, but uh, he is not one who uh, clears the guilty, and hence we uh, talk about justice. Micah will talk about justice, because he is a God uh, who doesn't uh, clear the guilty. He is holy, he is perfect, though he is abundant in love. Do you remember the uh, African in the book of Acts. He was uh, from Ethiopia. He uh, went to uh, Jerusalem to worship. Maybe he had some uh, free time, vacation. Uh, while he was there, or maybe he had it before, he got a copy of the scriptures. And uh, then he returned home. And uh, by the Spirit of God, Philip met him uh, in his uh, chariot. And uh, Philip discerned he was reading from the book of Isaiah, a prophet, not one of the minor prophets, but a major prophet, as we call it. And uh, Philip asked him, you know, hey, uh, African, what are you reading? And uh, the Ethiopian uh, said in so many words, how should I know unless, someone, unless there's someone to guide me? Well, I'm wondering if uh, some of us feel that way sometimes when we're reading through uh, not only a major prophet, but, but a minor prophet. How do I know? Sometimes the prophets can be a difficult read. If you don't feel that way, that's okay. Uh, if, but if you don't feel that way, just let me know, because then I'll tell Chris, past, that is Pastor Chris, that uh, maybe you can be put in line for some of the uh, preaching for the Book of the Prophets. But uh, it, if it is... Uh, your thought as well. Sometimes reading the prophets is difficult. I don't know uh, what I'm reading. Let's do a little bit of a review. Uh, so Chris is, uh, Pastor Chris has gone through this as well. And, uh, but not all of you had uh, class, discipleship curriculum class last, last time we met with uh, Vito and Russell. So uh, let me go over a few things from that. First of all, Sometimes the prophets, the organization in the Book of Prophets seems unclear. Uh, but uh, you've got to keep in mind that uh, the prophets are summaries, kind of summaries of the best messages of the prophet over a, a long period of time. And it might be something like uh, someone uh, putting together all of Pastor Chris's best messages from the time... He began at Bethel till now, about 10 years. 
uh, but not the whole message. It's just a synopsis, just the summaries. They may be connected by themes, but uh, reading one after another uh, might be a bit challenging. Well, the prophets are something like that. Uh, they're messages over a long period of time, uh, but uh, key ideas are repeated, and we've got to look for those. And as we read the prophets, we, are always, uh, we should always have in mind that uh, two major themes— are simply uh, judgment and salvation. And uh, really, salvation through judgment. Salvation, purification, which is what God is trying to do with us through uh, judgment. Uh, so the messages go kind of like that. And sometimes they alternate. Sometimes there isn't uh, clear transitions. So you have to read carefully. You have to think uh, hard. Uh, and it can be, uh, can be challenging. But I can look for those things. A judgment message will often consist of two parts. Uh, the Lord will, will lay out his accusation against uh, his people. Some, uh, some sin or various sins. We'll look at a few of those today in, in the book of Micah. And then as a result, he'll say what he's going to do. He'll bring judgment. And it's all in accordance with his word. Uh, with, with the law, with a book of uh, essentially Deuteronomy. Salvation messages uh, can be, uh, as uh, Phil read, uh, a picture of, uh, of uh, a perfect time of the rule of the, of the greatest of all kings. Or it might describe, uh, in a more straightforward way, just uh, what God intends to do. To, to bless, to give the fullness of his blessings in accordance with his covenant love that we hear about in his name to his people. Uh, so we can be looking for those things uh, as we're reading, and that'll help us uh, organize uh, what the prophet is saying. And actually, in the book of Micah, uh, many see uh, the word hear, that is listen, or hear the Lord, beginning uh, at uh, chapter 1, you can see it also in chapter 3 and in chapter 6 and kind of see kind of three parts to the book of Micah. And in each of those parts, sections, there's judgment and then salvation. Judgment, salvation, judgment, and salvation. So uh, Micah is indeed uh, going someplace. But another difficulty is uh, sometimes... Uh, let me be a, a grammarian. Sometimes the pronouns don't uh, indicate, at least in the immediate context, who is being referred to, who the referent is. So you have a lot of, you know, I or we, you, your, they, their. Well, well who are these? Who is the they? Who is the he? Uh, well, again, uh, we have to look for, key, for cues, and sometimes our, our theology uh, helps us to discern that. Uh, let me give a, for instance, just, uh, and I'll read for you the uh, last two verses in chapter 2. Uh, this is after a message of judgment. And then verse 12 says, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold, like flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. So who's the I? If we think of maybe New Testament themes, sure, we might think of the Lord. Then verse 13 says, He who opens the breach goes up before them. Now who's the he? It was I, now it's he. And then they break through and pat, now who's the they? They break through and pass the gate going out of it, or out by it. Their king passes on before them. Then a key at the end, the Lord, Yahweh, is at their head. So this is uh, some images. It doesn't give a lot of details or specifics, uh, but those images are important. Uh, this is a, a promised blessing, promised salvation. And uh, the Lord will be at the head of his people. Again, uh, we don't have time to, to read through the whole book of uh, Micah, but uh, leadership 
in uh, Micah's day was abusive. They were using uh, their power for their own gain. Uh, things, uh, society was chaotic in that way. Prosperous, but chaotic, and there was injustice. So here's a promise that uh, things, when God uh, comes, will be better. And uh, the kind of leader that all of us are looking for, a shepherd, someone who cares, is able to gather the flock and protect them, is coming. The Lord's the one at, at, at their head. And actually in, in verse 13, the one who opens the breach and breaks through. Uh, now we're not going to pick that up in English, but if I was a Hebrew speaker, I would make a connection, and this is what the prophets do. They know richly the word of God. They were making a connection with Genesis and uh, chapter 38. They remember the story of Judah. Remember uh, Judah and Tamar. Judah was becoming a, a Canaanite. He was living uh, like an unbeliever. And uh, Tamar was clinging to the promises of God. Uh, she knew that uh, she was to be the one to carry on the line of the tribe of Judah. And Judah was messing it up. Uh, so uh, just to, to move forward, fast forward, uh, Tamar's faith was honored. And uh, in a very risky way, she gave birth to uh, the next son of Judah. And uh, they called him uh, Perez. Well, in Hebrew, that word uh, Perez sounds like, uh, or it's related to breach, or opens the breach, or breakthrough. Uh, so the story in Genesis 38 you know, speaks to that time of God's intervention. And it was through Tamar, God's intervention to continue his promises, to carry on his plan for blessing. When mankind, even his own people, were in danger of messing it up, same thing in Micah's time. God's people are, are messing it up, but God's going to come. He's going to make a, a breakthrough through the breach. He's going to bring uh, at the head a shepherd. So uh, 12 and 13, if I read it quickly, pass over, I might uh, miss some of the connections, but uh, definitely hear uh, a promise of blessing that the Lord wants to do. So organization, to pick up on it, I have to think about judgment and salvation, and then uh, you know, read those pronouns carefully and look for, for clues who might be identified by them. The other thing about uh, the uh, prophets that make it a difficult read sometime is it's poetry. So uh, if we like straightforward communication, we'll struggle with poetry because poetry is elusive. It's sometimes ambiguous. There are different levels of meaning, but it's rich. Uh, why poetry? Because it should evoke emotion, should enable us to engage with what the speaker is saying. Consider uh, this part of the judgment speech in the beginning of chapter 3. Micah's addressing uh, the leaders, and uh, he says, is it not for you to know justice? And the implication is, why don't you guys act in justice the way God demands? And uh, listen to the image here. In fact, uh, if I could remove a few words or the, the reference to people, uh, I might think that uh, someone like, you know, we have some hunters in, in, in our fellowship. Uh, our reader this morning, Phil's one. Uh, even uh, pastor is a, is a hunter. So listen to the description. You who hate the good and love the evil, this is verse 2, chapter 3, who tear the skin off of my people and their flesh off of their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off of them and break their bones in pieces, chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. Almost seems... Uh, kind of uh, almost uh, X-rated or R-rated for the Bible. But uh, Micah wants to generate a response. And the people are spiritually dull. 
So he's hitting hard uh, with this uh, evocative uh, metaphor. And uh, were they actually acting like cannibals? Well, not in a literal way, but in terms of carrying out God's standards of justice. Yes, they were. And uh, Micah wanted them to feel it. So when we're reading the prophets, sometimes we have to slow down and uh, think about the uh, images that are being presented uh, that either uh, you know, surface with intensity, uh, the sins, or maybe want to comfort us uh, with the greatest comfort uh, when there are messages of salvation, like some of the ones that uh, Phil had read. Another difficulty with reading the prophets is sometimes the matter of application. So uh, who, is, uh, who is in mind for the applications? Uh, so just a few thoughts here. This would actually take a whole discipleship curriculum course. But uh, just a few things is that uh, actually when we're reading the prophecies, we don't know how literal the fulfillments will be. So uh, again, they're images. Uh, they portray pictures for us. So how literally should we see them? Well, we don't really know that until after the fact. So some of those images we're, we're waiting on to see what God will do. And uh, we, can't, uh, you know, we can't zoom with uh, Micah to find out exactly what he had in mind. So uh, the Lord wants us to wrestle with that. And think of the big picture. Think of uh, uh, the, uh, the great works that he's doing. Uh, another thing is that uh, sometimes in uh, one of those messages or several back-to-back -back messages, uh, the uh, events that are future that are being described are kind of pushed all together in, as one. So uh, there isn't really any distinct chronology. So we shouldn't think or be so stressed out about figuring out chron chronology when we read prophecy. Again, uh, think of the big things, what God is doing, what is he working towards, uh, what, uh, what are his, his plan, his will. Uh, for instance, in chapters 4 and 5 in Micah, uh, chapters uh, that speak of God's salvation to come, uh, there's mention, first of all, of Assyria, and then uh, of Bethlehem, where the king would come from, and then uh, back to B Babylon. So uh, I won't go through the times, but you know that it's going back and forth chronologically. And then uh, at the end of chapter 5, it speaks of the remnant of Jacob. Well, which remnant of Jacob? It describes future. Well, who's included in the remnant of Jacob? So again, good, good questions. Uh, not going to resolve them all now, but again, just to, to uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, keep the patterns, the big picture in mind and the patterns in which uh, God is working uh, in mind because the prophets love to uh, talk about the future in terms of what God has done in the past. So they'll speak of uh, deliverance or redemption, in the future, much like what had happened in the Pentateuch during, for instance, the Exodus, uh, the greatest of uh, Old Testament uh, examples of redemption. So, you know, we have to think uh, broadly about things and, and make those connections. So you have to kind of free your thinking. Uh, that's what the prophets are. I mean, they're preachers. Uh, they're using every angle they can to engage the audience that sometimes is missing the point and not living the life that God wants, uh, the prophet is trying to bring them ba back uh, to the Word of God to know and to understand. So Micah, in context, a, a few things uh, to uh, continue our focus um, to uh, maybe overcome some of those uh, difficulties in reading. First of all, we look at the heading. Micah gave us a heading. Uh, remember that uh, when we went through the prophet Joel, he didn't do that. But uh, Micah's heading 
connects him with Isaiah and uh, connects him as well with Hosea. And in fact, if I read Micah and Isaiah together, there's some similar themes. Can't trace them all now, but uh, even in chapter 4, we'll look at that if we, if we have time. Uh, but chapter 4 actually has, first five verses, same part or same salvation prophecy of the kingdom, future kingdom, that Isaiah has. So uh, Isaiah and Micah were buddies. Uh, they were uh, uh, co-laborers in uh, ministry together. And then uh, Hosea as well might have been known by, by Micah. The same kings that are mentioned. Again, the heading says, The word of the Lord that came to Micah of uh, Moresheth in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So both uh, north and south. Uh, so uh, that's something of Micah's historical context. He's going to be speaking of the same themes. Uh, he's going to be speaking, uh, for instance, of the incomparableness of Yahweh. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Isaiah 40. If you've forgotten, you can go back and, and read that. But uh, the Lord says, no, who, are you going to compare, com com who are you going to compare me to? Is there anyone like me? Uh, it's a theme throughout the uh, second part of Isaiah. So uh, Micah is picking up on that as well. And uh, then as well in our, our heading there, there's kind of a, a subtle biographical note. Micah came from uh, not Jerusalem, but uh, Moresheth. So that's, uh, archaeologists tell us, 22 miles southwest of Jerusalem, so that was his home. It was in the Shephala, the Rolling Plains, beautiful place in Israel, a uh, farming area. It was near the uh, Philistine border. But at some point, he decided he was going to go to Jerusalem. Don't know when or why, but most likely, most certainly, it was in relation to his call to ministry, to, uh, to go to Jerusalem to do ministry. So uh, he was leaving home, uh, leaving uh, whatever uh, businesses he had uh, there uh, to go and uh, to do the work of the Lord in Jerusalem. And uh, it was not easy, but uh, he was willing. He uh, wasn't welcome at all points, but uh, surprisingly, Micah, you know, with Isaiah led a revival. Remember one of the kings was Hezekiah. So uh, I don't have time to go into that, but uh, you have to go back to Isaiah 36 to 39 or Kings uh, to, uh, or Chronicles to read about uh, Hezekiah, one of the good kings. But interestingly, in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah's day, when uh, Jeremiah was being persecuted for his message, Someone remembered Micah. This is a uh, hundred years or more difference. And in Jeremiah 26, verse 17, it says, Certain of the elders of the land arose and spoke to the assembled people, saying, Micah of Moresheth, the minor prophet, prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and said to all the people of Judah, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed as a field. It's a message of judgment. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. In other words, become desolate. So here's the application in Jeremiah's day, 19. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him to death? Micah? No. Did he... That is, Hezekiah not fear the Lord and entreat the favor of the Lord, and did not the Lord in, relent of the disaster that he had pronounced against them? And for uh, Jeremiah in Jeremiah's day, but we are about to bring great disaster upon ourselves, i.e., by not listening to the word of God. So uh, Micah was uh, part of a of a great revival. 
in, uh, in Israel, Judah. Unfortunately, it didn't last with the next king, but for a time, uh, Micah with Isaiah, you know, turned the direction of the nation so they would not uh, submit to, uh, to Assyria or Egypt, uh, but their trust would be in the Lord, and the Lord preserved in that the miraculous way that you can read about. Uh, another thing about the context of, my, of uh, Micah is uh, that, uh, as you know, it's one of the uh, minor prophets. Well, in uh, Judaism, they see the prophets, the minor prophets, all 12 of them, as, as one book. So if I am seeing them as one book, then I can be inclined to read them together. If I'm going to read them together, then I'm going to read for, again, uh, common themes. So indeed, uh, in the middle of the minor prophets, we have Jonah, Micah, and Nahum, be next week, and they all say something of the name of God. They build upon the name of God that we talk, the name of Yahweh, and uh, connected with repentance. You know, in Jonah, the pagans repented, uh, and uh, based upon God's compassion. Jonah didn't like that, but uh, God is a God who forgives transgression, iniquity, and sin. Now, in Micah's day, that's the challenge. God is one who's abundant. He can, he'll cast our sins into the depths of the sea, but uh, he demands justice. Uh, he demands uh, upright li living. So will the people repent? Kind of uh, left open in uh, Micah. And then in Nahum, it's kind of, uh, you know, round two of, uh, of Jonah, back with Nineveh. Are they going to repent? Are they going to maintain their repentance? Well, they didn't. And uh, God uh, by no means clears the guilty. So uh, those three books in the middle kind of fit together. And again, they could be related. We had Joel already. could be related to Joel. Joel speaks of the name of Yahweh in the context of repentance. Uh, so these are some of the themes as well in the book of Micah. Yahweh will not ignore injustice, but he is without rival. He's uh, incomparable in covenant love and uh, forgiveness so that uh, a wise response, one of the encouragements in the book of Micah, a wise response is to fear the Lord, like Micah exemplifies for us. So uh, moving through uh, some of the main points in my uh, book of Micah, and uh, again, I'm going to be doing that uh, quickly. Uh, I won't be able to read all the scriptures I'd like to, but uh, first point where Micah begins, I have written, uh, there you go, Yahweh comes triumphantly against You'd say false worship, or I'm using a fake worship. Comment that on a minute. But uh, look, let's look, let me read for you where Micah begins. Again, uh, verse 2. Hear, you peoples, all of you. Pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it. God's the creator of heavens and earth. And let the Lord God, Yahweh God, be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. So he's coming. Behold, Yahweh is coming from his place, will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. What are the high places? High places, uh, places of worship, kind of the uh, ancient Near Eastern mentality. I'm going to get close to God by going to a high place. Well, that's, those are forbidden. Uh, there's only one place, once uh, Jerusalem was set up, only one place in which uh, to worship God ritually. Let me uh, pass verse 4, verse 5. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? In other words, the idolatry, the false worship there. 
and the consequent injustice? And uh, is it not, uh, and what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? So the place where the creator of heaven and earth was to be worshipped, he wasn't being worshipped. The worship was corrupted, compromised, disturbed. Therefore, I will make Samaria a heap in the open country, a place for planting vineyards. I will pour down her stones into the valley and uncover her foundations. All her carved images shall be beaten to pieces. All her wages shall be burned with fire. All her idols I will lay waste. The Lord comes uh, triumphantly against uh, false worship. Uh, fake worship, if you permit me to use the term. And in uh, chapter 5, uh, verses uh, 10 to, to 15, similarly speaks of uh, a day. I'm not going to read those verses, but uh, it uh, speaks of the day when the Lord's going to cut off every false trust, whether it's uh, military or any other human accomplishment or false worship, idols, uh, the Lord's going to cut it off. I will cut it off. I will root it out. I can't have it. Well, God, remember, he's a God who abounds in covenant love and faithfulness. All that God's love gives, forgiveness, and all the fullness of uh, earthly blessings, how can he give it if the people don't receive it? if they're going someplace else for uh, the blessings that they want. Well, it can't happen. <laughs> Only the Lord is, is the source. So the Lord, Yahweh, he comes triumphantly in that chapter 5 con context with a lifted up hand, just like in the days of Exodus. You know what, a, what an athlete does when he does that, well, there, that's nothing compared to the Lord's hand. When he raises his hand, then uh, it's, a, it's a complete wipeout if he comes. There, no one can stand. Uh, everyone is, is blown away. Uh, there is no chance for a comeback. Verse, verse 9 in chapter 5, he comes triumphantly against all rivals because he's a jealous God. And uh, I'm calling it uh, any, any supposed rival to God, fake worship. And uh, yes, I'm using the contemporary term, but I'm not going to comment on any uh, political allegiances. But uh, if you're familiar with that term and how it's used, uh, you know that it, uh, it raises up, again, the emotions and emotive response and uh, we might uh, think of uh, um, the uh, lies or deceit that are attributed uh, with that term and the way it's used. Same thing here. False worship, an idol, an idol of the heart is uh, more fake than anything uh, that is called fake today. I mean, we're talking about uh, the Lord of uh, all heaven and earth and uh, supposed rivals or any rival that man would put there. It's just uh, uh, incongruous. Uh, it uh, should, should fill us with a great disdain uh, for anything that uh, takes away uh, glory uh, to our God. So... Uh, the uh, greatest, summarize here, the greatest, most conse consequential, uh, the most overarching justice issue is not at the horizontal level between people, not that those aren't legitimate, but the starting point, the greatest, you know, Pastor Chris has told us that as well as the vertical. So uh, what happens this way is never going to make sense if this is not right, if there's not uh, true worship. 
And uh, I, think, uh, I think we can see that in uh, some of the chaos and unrest of our country today. So uh, um, Deuteronomy, again, uh, tells us God's intent. Deuteronomy 18 uh, proclaims, Moses proclaims, when you come into the land that Yahweh your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. That means any idolatry, false worship, consulting uh, sorcerers, any kind of uh, spiritists, uh, anything, any fake worship. And then the point is, uh, in the same context, is uh, you shall be blameless before Yahweh your God. That's what the Lord is after. Um, are we going to be blameless if we're caught up in uh, idols of the heart? Uh, idolatry, false worship, fake worship? It's not possible. Only uh, the God who is holy, the God who abounds in covenant love and faithfulness, the God who pardons, the God who's compassionate and gracious, only he is the one who can source, empower us with those attributes. And that's where he's going. That's, uh, that's why the prophets speak of judgment and as well give those salvation uh, images, glimpses, to keep us moving on along the right track. You know, uh, let me uh, close here with, uh, I, I always am uh, encouraged and also bothered by uh, David Pallison recently went to be with the Lord, um, got to hear him uh, in the classroom, and Miriam State took classes with him, <clears throat> but he has some x-ray questions or encouragements that, uh, I mean, we don't, we don't have uh, uh, idolatry like in the ancient Near East, but uh, we still have idols of the heart. Uh, the heart is, remains desperately wicked and deceitful, and uh, even our regenerated hearts uh, can be tempted. So uh, a few David Powelson x-ray questions to help us think through that. What do you want? What do you desire? What do you crave? What do you long for? What are your plans, agendas, strategies, intentions designed to accomplish? Making disciples? Glorifying God? or something else. What do you pray for? The fact that we pray, David says, does not necessarily mean we are where we should be spiritually. On the contrary, prayer can be a key revealer of the idols of the hearts. Prayer can reveal patterns of self-centeredness, self-righteousness, fear of man, so forth. You know, what is, I'm praying, good start, but what am I really passionate about in my prayers? Is it coming from, from God, from the Word of God, where He's heading? I, I wanted to mention as well Titus chapter 2. Think of what, uh, what God is doing, the fulfillment of that. Uh, Titus 2, 13 and 14, our hope, you know, uh, the hope of the appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. What did that giving accomplish? Same thing that Mike is concerned about, to uh, redeem us from all lawlessness, kinds of things we read about in Micah, and also to purify for himself, for Jesus, a people of his own possession, that remnant, that inheritance. And for what purpose? Zealous for good works. See, that's uh, what Mike is about too. Micah uh, six eight. If we if we get to that, Micah six eight. Uh, one more David Powelson question, especially in our time of. Uh, yeah, difficulties. What do you see as your rights? What do you feel entitled to? Do you feel 
What do you feel is your right to expect, seek, require, or demand? Especially when they're being taken away. Are my, but are my rights, I'm adding this, are my rights as an American citizen also divinely ordained rights from Yahweh? So uh, let us uh, think through some of those questions to ensure that uh, we're free of fake, fake worship and that we're rejoicing when the Lord comes against it. Uh, the Lord comes against as well injustice. Yahweh condemns injustice, but never impatiently. So uh, again, this is a second part maybe of the judgment uh, speeches in the book of Micah. And uh, as we mentioned, the injustice issues logically follow from the false worship issues. If I'm not right with God, there's no way I'm going to be right with every other person. Uh, because to be right with every other person in difficult situations certainly requires his resources, his resources of love and forgiveness, compassion and patience. If worship is fake, then justice will be fake, or at best, it'll be uh, incomplete and inconsistent. I think that's what we can readily see around us uh, today. Uh, justice must flow from Yahweh and uh, from his teachings. Uh, just think of God's government in the uh, ancient world, ancient Israel, Ten Commandments, two uh, tablets, Second half, deal with my relationship with people. You know, uh, horizontal level. First half, my relationship with God. So uh, you can think of the relationship in regards to David's sin. You know, he, he violated every one of those. You know, think through them. You can uh, trace through them yourself. First, it started with coveting. And that's actually mentioned in, uh, in Micah. Uh, the first sin that he mentions, they coveted. So the one that's hard to detect because it's an issue of the heart. Everything else is uh, observable. Uh, coveting is not always immediately observable. But uh, there's David. Started with covenant, and then he violated them all, which suggests that he wasn't right. Here, the man after God's heart at that time wasn't right with God either. So uh, indeed, uh, there... But by the grace of God go I as well. So uh, David reflected upon that in Psalm 51. You know, even though he broke the second part of the commandments, he say the way he worded it, he said, not to ignore that, but he said, against you, against you only have I sinned, Yahweh. You know, and I, and I deserve, uh, uh, I don't deserve uh, your grace and mercy. That was his appeal. So uh, it's the same uh, for us today, even, even nationally. Of course, uh, we're not uh, uh, the uh, national people of God in America, but uh, where God's standards are ignored, uh, violated, or only inconsistently adhered to, well, there's going to be problems in uh, justice areas. Um, so uh, you, you can trace that out. And uh, let me say, as we, we talk about justice, uh, we can say, uh, I don't necessarily encourage it because of the confusion, but we can speak of actually social justice. Now, don't, don't turn me off. You know, Chris used the word, Pastor Chris used the word societal justice, or just justice. But, you know, actually social justice uh, begins in the Bible. And it's a term that uh, the world has uh, taken away from the church, from the scriptures, and kind of transformed it. Uh, it'd be possible for us to take it back. Uh, again, we can use different terms, but the notion of social justice, you know, right and just relationships with all people, you know, the care for every member of society and that's a biblical idea. That's God's idea. It's not a human idea or any human government's idea. 
It's God's idea. So uh, to uh, put all those justice issues in right relationship, it takes that uh, proper relationship with the Lord. Uh, I don't have time to uh, demonstrate from Scripture, but uh, two words, righteousness and justice, or sometimes it's translated judgment, those two words together are often paired. Uh, they come together in different forms. Um, I didn't take a count. I should have counted, but uh, you know, upwards, you know, may maybe about 100 times or close to 100 times. So it's a major theme in Scripture, obviously. Uh, and uh, again, it comes uh, from God. Uh, God's throne is uh, rooted in righteousness and justice and judgment. Uh, that was uh, what was demanded of the Davidic king, righteousness and justice, social justice or societal justice. The king was to make sure that was uh, done over all his reign. Uh, a good passage uh, would be uh, Psalm 72, verse 1. Sorry, we can't go there. Look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 22, 2 to 5. Jeremiah 23, 5 and six, Yahweh our righteousness speaks of the branch that's coming, the righteous branch. Who is that? Of course, it's the perfect king, the perfect son of David. Jesus brings perfect societal justice, perfect, if you will, social justice, uh, because he knows, as we read in uh, Isaiah 11, he does it perfectly by the Spirit without fail. So Micah preaches against uh, violations of societal justice. Uh, I don't have time to, to read. I'm looking at the time, so I'm not going to read all the passages, but uh, chapter 2, there's abuse of power by those in power, uh, possessing property, you know, victimizing um, the vulnerable of society, children, uh, widows, uh, dishonesty in business practices. See that in chapter 6, verse 11. Bribery, beginning of chapter 7. And uh, even uh, perhaps abiding by unjust laws, following in the statutes of Omri and Ahab. If you remember those characters, the worst, among the worst kings in, uh, in Israel. I uh, remember the uh, story of Jacob or Naboth's vineyard. Sorry, I don't have time to go into that. Uh, but uh, look at what Micah is, uh, you know, uh, focused intently upon and uh, courageously calling out among his people. So uh, I wonder what Micah would tell us today, what we should confront uh, again, we can't zoom him in. Um, Say, so uh, look at uh, Bethel. I think uh, we have done well in some uh, issues. Bethel has champions, for instance, for foster care, adoption of kids uh, without a quality home. Uh, Bethel has champions uh, for the rights of the unborn. Uh, for those uh, living with disabilities, for uh, equipping urban youth, and uh, even for uh, racial healing. And I'd like to pause at that point uh, here and uh, encourage us, at least as a church, to think, continue to think more about ra racial reconciliation. And I'm not an authority on this, uh, but uh, I think it's a strategic time to, to think about it, even uh, as a church, even uh, beyond what, what we're doing. A few things uh, come to mind. Uh, first of all, certainly it's, uh, it's unavoidable, unavoidable for us to think about uh, if we're uh, paying attention to what's going on in our country. And uh, what's going on is going on without wholesome clarity. So uh, what do I do? How do I respond? How do I sort through 
all what's being said. We might think of, as well, our Bethel One, Beth, uh, our Bethel One for Wilmington connection. How can we build upon that genuinely towards uh, racial healing is another term, not just reconciliation, but healing. Uh, we might uh, consider, I'll put in a, a plug for the missions team. We have a, a racial, a, a champion for racial reconciliation in our uh, missions uh, chair uh, with Brett, and, and he's done it uh, in, uh, in his college years and, and is still doing that. And as well, um, I, uh, I have an SIM colleague who is doing it in the greater Philadelphia area with, uh, he calls it a, a, a bridge builder team. So uh, black and white, they're together, they meet in prayer, and they talk, they communicate. They also hold training for, uh, for churches, uh, for maybe uh, uh, ethnically uh, distinct churches meeting together and uh, talking about the issue. So uh, um, I want to pursue that with him. He's uh, offered to come to Bethel to do that. So uh, please keep your antennas up for any uh, survey notices uh, for interest. But then uh, as you think about the issue, think of it uh, maybe with, with Tony Evans, if you know that name. He's uh, author of this book and many other books. He's a pastor in Dallas. He was my evangelism teacher when I was at Dallas Seminary. He was the first African-American to graduate with a doctorate from Dallas. So he's written this book, Oneness Embraced. Listen to what uh, he says about the need for racial healing. Again, there's confusion on this. Um, Secular history has often excluded the whole truth from its record of accounts. It has rewritten the annals of our foundation to offer a one-sided and limited view of the founding of our nation. Even though African Americans were involved and present as freed men, and not only as slaves, in the critical junctures of the birthing of our land, our history books, mainstream movies, and often even our artistic renditions show little or no racial diversity. African-American heroes of such important battles, such as the Battle of Bunker, Bunker Hill, are not only completely absent from mainstream historical counts, but also more recently explained away out of paintings made by those who witnessed the battle firsthand. So they were involved. And uh, here's kind of a reflection on that, Tony says. Uh, what this has done in America, in the America psyche, is elevate one group of people, white Americans, above all others. This is his words, not mine. Not only does it disconnect African Americans from any personal heritage to our nation, but it also offers an incomplete and inaccurate view of ourselves an erroneous view of oneself or a misguided view of another, as is the case when whites are taught an anemic view of black achievement and involvement in our land and churches leads to actions that perpetuate the illusion on both sides and maybe even uh, fake justice. That's my addition. More positively, consider what he says here at another point. As he's thinking, he's thinking about the black church and comparing it with the New Testament church, which is what we always want to do. We want to be like the New Testament church. Think of this, and again, you have to read the book for the development of his idea. When we examine the New Testament definition of the church and juxtapose it with the functioning of the historical black church, it becomes clear that the two institutions were very similar. That's his claim. As such, these two institutions, that is the New Testament church, historical black church, are in a unique position to teach both the black and white churches of today 
what true biblical Christianity looks like when it operates in a church that truly makes God the center of its existence. So again, that's, that's just a teaser there. You have to read the book to flesh it out. But uh, if, if it's true, you know, again, uh, meeting together uh, with our brothers and sisters in Wilmington, church-wide, making friendships, building relationships, can be instructive for us, for our spiritual life, for our spiritual health as the people of God at Bethel. Uh, but I need to move on. So we've talked about judgment. What about salvation? And now we're going to be moving through this too quickly. As I said in chapters 4 and 5, the major salvation messages. We looked at the end of chapter 2 as well. You can go to chapter 7. The book ends with a salvation message. But uh, we see that God wonderfully, his plan is to wonderfully restore kingdom justice for all. So uh, these salvation messages provide that motivation for societal justice, for doing what's uh, right. And again, it uh, keeps in mind, keeps us before us what God has in mind. So very quickly, we'll talk about, let me read through this vision of the kingdom, verse 4, and then this mention of the, of the uh, king as quickly as I can. Well, let me just... Uh, well, maybe you know it from some songs as well, but verse 4, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 1, it shall come to pass in the later days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of mountains, and it shall be lifted up on the hills, and people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, hey, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. Wouldn't that be wonderful? To have that now. And what do they want to do? That he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law. The law. That's the basis for social justice, true social justice. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And that he shall judge. And then you know that this is in Isaiah too. The uh, implements war implements be built into farming implements so there be peace no more war you know justice will really be in place when the word of god is central and when the king is there when all the nations are bound by it and are delighted to learn and everyone in verse four will be at peace so sit under your fig tree or whatever else you have your oak tree i don't know in in, uh, in delaware and uh, we will all walk, we will all walk in the name, verse 5, of the Lord, Yahweh our God, forever and ever. See, that's where God's headed to. Uh, that's why he comes in judgment, to purify, to bring us to the point of walking uh, with him. That's what the kingdom is about. That's what he wants to do. That's what justice is about. And the king's going to do it. The king is a shepherd. Uh, so we have that remarkable prophecy in Verse 2, chapter 5. You, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is the ruler of Israel, who is coming forth of his old from ancient of days. And in verse 4, he shall stand and shepherd the, his flock. So we know that's Jesus. Uh, we can think of the uh, Gospel of John, John chapter 10. He's the true shepherd. He's not a hireling. He's the true shepherd that cares for his own. So he is. Verse 4. In the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord is God. The result? They. So all of God's people will dwell, dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. We should just be blown away with this, uh, uh, not only his ministry, but the prophecy. This is about 700 years, 725 years before Jesus came. And he's identifying the, the town, little village town, not only a town, but Ephrathah, probably a district or neighborhood. This is our God. This is the magnitude of our God's sovereignty. 700 years. What's, can you imagine uh, here, northern Wilmington, 
Marsh Road, 700 years. You think Del Dot will be finished? The, uh, <laughs> the uh, entry ramp down there by then? 700 years, the Lord knows the place. He knows the neighborhood. And it's, not, and it's too little. It's un- utterly unimpressive. God's going to put the greatest of all kings there. He's going to make it happen. And it's maybe not even known fully at this point. This is the magnitude of our God's sovereignty and uh, the fact that he is going to restore kingdom justice for all, for all that uh, walk according to his word. When the word is central, when the word is, when we abide by the word, then the promises uh, flow uh, through the king, and that should fill us uh, with hope. Uh, There's more that I could say there, but I can't right now, other than to remind us, again, thinking of the sovereignty of God, and you know, you know, think about your life and how it fits into the kingdom. You know, it's, it's not easy, but uh, what was said to, to Mary and Sarah is the same thing that is said to us. Remember, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, how will it be? It is the Virgin Mary. Sarah, is anything too difficult? That means anything too wonderful for God? God wonderfully restores. Wonderfully means only something only God can do. Is anything too wonderful for Yahweh? Not for Mary, not for Sarah and God, Abraham and God's kingdom purposes, not for any one of us, because uh, his kingdom justice is for all of us. I'm going to have to stop here and uh, pull a uh, Pastor Chris although I, I won't uh, video it, but I have a last point. Uh, who will be Michaelite for justice? Uh, I want you to think about that and meditate on it, but uh, um, maybe I'll put, have it put in the uh, announcements, just a brief outline, a few, four points with some scripture to meditate upon, but uh, especially uh, thinking about... Uh, um, Micah said he was spirit-filled. That's one thing, verse 8 in chapter 3. But I'm looking at chapter 7, 7. So uh, this is uh, what I'll leave you with, with Micah, in view of uh, all that God has planned for us. But as for me, this is Micah now, the me is Micah, I will look to the Lord, but we can be Micah-like. So we can do the same thing today. We're waiting for that kingdom. Uh, The king, we know all the more because the king has come. The shepherd has come. He shepherds us even now. The perfection of that, the consummation of that is yet to come. So I, with Micah, I will wait for the God of my salvation. And then look at this. My God will hear me. You know, in, in Hebrew, might be unimpressive to you, but uh, only two words. Yishma'ani Elohe. God will hear me. God will hear me. So that's what we have, especially when we're kingdom focused, when we're in line with his word, in line with his standards for justice, uh, when we're on board with what he's working towards because he's the sovereign God. God will hear me. Amen.